Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, we finally have some nice weather, so <laughs> your heart must be ticking quite fast for uh, open source AI governance and all that. And if so, you're a bit like me. Uh, my name is Zoran. I'm a software architect from Volvo Cars. I'm located in the south of Sweden. I'm a uh, member of the enterprise architecture team in uh, Volvo Cars, and I work in the uh, open source program office there, as well as legal and compliance working group of the uh, AI governance team. And by the show of hands, how many of you are working in the open source program office? Oh, some of you are. And how many of you are working in the AI governance? <laughs> One <laughs> or two and some overlaps. And that's, that's super cool because for those of you who raise your hands, uh, most of what I will say will probably sound very obvious. But uh, bear with me while I think a bit out loud uh, and hope that I won't confuse those who didn't raise their hands. But I don't know about you. But uh, when I talk to people, uh, engineers, managers alike, their first associations to governance are monitoring, enforcement, policing. So I went and asked uh, an LLM what governance is, and it answered something like, governance refers to processes, systems, structures, make decisions, manage organizations, etc., etc." It seems uh, pretty close to what uh, Wikipedia had to say on the topic. Governance, system, framework, processes, structures, organized groups, very similar, right? Which is only understandable because probably Wikipedia was uh, being used as a source of training data for that LLM. It also sounds quite familiar to those of you from uh, OSPO and uh, AI governance, and because the definition provides a common blueprint for the governance at large, right? But as contingency theory of organization would state, uh, even with the blueprint, there's no one right way to organize, right? Uh, but contingency theory does explain fairly well the history of OSPO and AI governance, at least in, uh, in Volvo cars, and how emerging needs led to creation and expansion of organization following efforts to meet uh, business objectives. So a bit of history. Prior to my arrival to Volvo cars in 2022, open source was handled a bit ad, ad hoc uh, by a handful of volunteers who used practically their spare time to make sense of what open source was and actually did a pretty good job at understanding the compliance checklist from OpenChain. But then a critical mass of experts were hired in a short amount of time during uh, 2022. This is a good point in time to mention that uh, prior to coming to Volvo Cars, I used to work in uh, Sony Mobile Open Source Operations, how we used to call the uh, uh, open source program office. Anyway, in January 2023, we created OSPO in uh, Volvo Cars, and soon after we were able to announce OpenChain Conformant program. Yay, Volvo. And in fact, today we run a managed, coherent, at least internally consistent open source program office. And then somewhere around that time, LLMs made a lot of waves and we still feel that splash, right? Uh, we started getting a lot of questions in OSPO about uh, how to handle code generated by an LLM. So thanks to, well, again, almost serendipitous overlaps in uh, competences. Probably a good point in time to mention that I sort of uh, dabbled in the machine learning research at the university prior to my arrival to Sony Mobile. And anyway, due to these emerging needs, we set a policy on uh, use of generated code, which was in essence an embryo of a generative AI committee that we have in Volvo Cars. I'll mention it later a bit. But AI existed before LLMs, right? It did. Anyone who disagrees? Well, indeed, AI goes a long way back in uh, Volvo cars with treasure trove of data to understand behaviors of cars, traffic, drivers, consumer habits, everything in between. Data analytics is a big part of uh, ways of working in uh, Volvo cars. Uh, data scientists, researchers work with data mining, clustering, prediction, sentiment analysis, quite a bit of uh, machine learning in general, including generative AI. And Volvo Cars is at the forefront of safety, right? So safety automation, uh, active safety is really important. And autonomous driving came into picture. So many uh, techniques and algorithms and like traditional uh, machine learning, pattern recognition, signal processing, filtering, and all of that is, uh, is used. So MLOps is organized to develop and maintain a common machine learning platform used across the board at uh, Volvo Cars. And like I mentioned, with the advent of LLMs, we introduced a generative AI committee, which is basically a cross-functional group of people looking at impact of using specifically generative AI within uh, Volvo cars. 
contingency theory aside, certain repeated patterns were noticeable, emerging convergence, if you will. And I like to think of it as carcinization, like how evolution of crustaceans uh, converges to crab, and certainly hoping that we don't just have a hammer on our hands and see nails everywhere. <clears throat> uh, yeah, where was I? Mind maps. I love mind maps. They help you navigate your way through your thoughts. And one uh, wonderful mind map I often go back to was created by a wonderful group of people here, uh, the to-do group. Uh, anyone from to-do group here? Thank you very much for this great thing, the mind map to describe and, well, better understand OSPO roles, responsibilities, behaviors. Find the link, if you don't know about it, in the lower left. And, you know, come to think of it, it's so useful that you could just replace all occurrences of open source with AI, or licensing copyright patent law with emerging AI regulations, and you have my talk. So thank you all for coming. Questions, comments? <laughs> just kidding. Uh, yeah, in software engineering, we love reusable components, frameworks, libraries, what have you. And we can look at this as one such framework, right? So let's take a peek at one of the nodes, responsibilities. That is, what is it we're trying to do, and what do others think we should be doing, am I right? Essence of alignment with uh, objectives, organizational objectives. The MyDev says, reminds us to develop and execute a strategy. So some of the first questions we ask ourselves, like existential questions, what are our organization's objectives? How do we get there? And it's very natural to start asking yourself these basic questions. What is it we want to do? You know, contingency number one, we need a plan. And it's, in essence, what strategy is, a high-level plan to achieve certain goals under certain conditions. Goals certainly have to align with broader goals of your organization, so we map business objectives to the use and development of open source, if we are in OSPO, use and development in AI within AI governance. And how do you do that? Well, as it turns out, there are many ways, but following an organic strategic planning methodology, we start with acknowledging the status quo, right? We map the environment. So what are the uh, products that we're building, right? In our case, it's cars, like these big computers on wheels. What are its building, uh, building components? Like in OSPO, we're interested if uh, operating system is uh, open source, if there are tools in open source that we can reuse. What data do we have access to? Which methods are at our disposal to analyze them? How to present all of this? How to sell it to, uh, to the outside world? Which cloud solutions are at our disposal? Node, Kubernetes, what feedback data points uh, we can get to analyze? What limitations do we have? What regulatory requirements are there? SCARs are driven globally uh, in many jurisdictions. So we're looking at Cyber Resilience Act, EU AI Act, we're looking at uh, executive order on artificial intelligence, et cetera. What ethical considerations we have to pay attention to, like license attribution and sus sustainability, and it's a layered, cross-functional, multi-year endeavor. But it's a continuous work. And so we map the environment, we identify the opportunities, you know, financial gain, shorter development cycle, greater reuse, innovation, and lay out a map of risks, ethical, privacy, security, legal. We imagine a wanted position, set some goals, set vision and mission, and we have a plan. But successful plan has to act like a uh, guiding star, rather a roadmap. And in this like fast moving space, it has to be flexible enough to allow organization to adapt to new realities, like when open source community changes a license, or how uh, AI technology like moves on a, like, on a daily basis, there's a new announcement on a new model. New regulations are popping up uh, around the globe. But so we start with some basic principles. And so in Volvo Cars and both open source and AI, we actually started with a few basic shared principles. Democratized federated decision-making process with clear escalation path, which is stemming from uh, Volvo Cars organizational culture where teams have a lot of autonomy in how they manage their development. It would be, <laughs> quite impractical for them to deviate far from each other, so we have to provide a set of common standards, guidelines, policies, which is where specific open source and specific AI policies and principles like license and standards compliance or explainability and sustainability would need to be more detailed. And to be able to employ them, 
We need to increase literacy and provide education. In practice, these strategy and principles are uh, documented in high level, relatively concise documents. They don't change often. Usually only minor course corrections are made due to changes in landscape. Major changes uh, would be done based on changes in business strategies primarily, also big organizational changes. Um, strategy and principle documents are then used to create the next level of fundamental documents that form basis for practical work, guidelines, directives, and policies. Sure enough, there's a note in the mind map, establish and improve policies, it reminds us. So we set the general uh, direction, but the work has just begun. And now a bit of digression here on uh, policies, a couple of my pet peeves. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, there's a certain need, a certain drive to start with policies focusing on risk management. And that is legitimate, of course, risk management is super important. But a piece of advice though, if I may offer one at this point, is to at least consider working on some positive policies, like what is you can do rather than what you must not do. Like engineers will thank you for that. Uh, for example, start with a policy on alignment with the organizational objectives, where you can describe company's policy on discovery and the consumption of external tools and frameworks, policy on research, collaboration, and similar, something that will give uh, engineering teams something immediate to work with. But then, of course, never forget the uh, super important risk management policies on regulatory compliance, security, privacy, sustainability, and so on. And make sure to write the policies collaboratively rather than prescriptively. Uh, talk to people affected, to policies, uh, affected by the policy. Uh, collaborate on the most efficient way to follow the spirit of the policy rather than prescribing what everyone must do or avoid doing. The way of open source is collaboration and focus on the outcome rather than strict rules and uh, formalities. So that way it makes it easier for everyone affected to make sense of the policy, uh, the reasoning behind it, and ultimately makes it easier for everyone to comply to it. It works. It works in open source, so let's apply it to AI governance as well. This in turn, uh, as a side effect, often has a policy that is a common denominator for a wider audience within the organization, as it's not trying to prescribe specific approaches, like specific tools or methods, but rather classes of uh, tools, methodologies. And teams can have the flexibility to apply that which is most suitable for their working environment without affecting their uh, productivity. And speaking of uh, productivity on a little bit more individual and, uh, say, detailed level, Something that policy writers don't pay a lot of attention to is the layout of the policy. You know, we should make it worth engineers' time to read it. It's very common that policy is written in such a way that requires a bit of time to digest, apply. Uh, they would start with an introduction, background, purpose, followed by definition, affected stakeholders. And then you go to the policy statement and potentially followed by some procedures that uh, you want followed. I find that, that those affected by the policy really appreciate it if uh, the policy statement is straightforward laid out on top, followed by the procedures, and this way you don't have to search through a long document uh, in search of what you should be doing. But then background information, definitions, stakeholders, other details, you know, laid out for those uh, who need to know the details. But uh, let's take uh, examples, uh, some examples of the policies that we had and you might have to, have to, to tackle. Uh, let's start with some uh, positive development pos policies. For example, let's start with a policy on discovery and consumption of uh, external AI tools and frameworks. A spectrum of frameworks and libraries, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, platforms open like Hagen Face, DeFi, Databricks, commercial, Azure Open AI, Amazon Bedrock, Google Gemini, what have you. Choice of technology stacks, Rust, Java, Python, all available is either as open source or as proprietary software and hardware solutions. And engineers naturally converge towards uh, GitHub and what's available there, uh, while data scientists and researchers on your teams will naturally go for what is probably the most popular source of uh, research papers on the web archive.org. They will go for other resources like IEEE, but how tools and frameworks and papers, their peer review reproducibility are vetted could and should be defined as a policy, depending on your company's or organization's appetite for investments in research, development, definitions of risk and risk tolerance. And should you merge with the policy on research? 
how you collaborate with universities and research centers, things uh, to consider. And with offices and big university centers, Volvo Cars and research centers enjoy fruitful collaboration. Policies should provide organizations wide view on the vetting process, describe criteria for the vetting, as the choice uh, of the tech stack can and will impact uh, the infrastructure, the ability to move fast through commoditized layers of the stack, and you need to empower innovation, right? Note here, again, we don't prescribe the exact choice, like you must use, I don't know, PyTorch. I mean, we all love and use PyTorch, of course, but you get my point. Instead of making a set choice, describe a way to reach the decision, the criteria that help you make the decision. And at one point, you will look at make by share analysis and provide criteria aligned with your organization's values and objectives, when and how to engage with sourcing, open source program office, export control teams, etc. And one interesting emerging resource that can help you out in the decision making process, Annie talked about it uh, yesterday in her talk, model openness framework developed in collaboration between research and generative AI commons within the Linux Foundation describes varying levels of completeness and uh, openness of machine learning models from open weights over open documentation, open source code for inference, training, etc., to open data provenance, which we could all use more of, right? Open science, essential not only to protect you and your uh, customers from uh, open washing, as Gabriele and uh, Annie uh, mentioned in their talks, but also for understanding how to deal with data protection, intellectual property protection, etc. How many of you have uh, seen Model Openness Framework? A few? Yeah? Cool. What do you think? Too difficult. Too difficult. <laughs> help the project, get involved, at least help populate the tables with relevant information. That'd be cool. I mentioned already policy on AI research and collaboration. If it should be a part of the policy on discovery of uh, tools and frameworks or general research and development policy, standalone policy is entirely up to you and your organization, whatever your objectives you optimize for. But definitely spend some uh, brain cycles on figuring out the models of collaboration with cutting edge research in AI, open source projects, universities, interest groups and similar. This is a fast moving space. You need to stay on top of ongoing development to be able to integrate solutions with least friction and least risk, most chance for innovation. And maximize benefits, not only for you and your organization, but also for society at large. Which is probably why you should have a sustainability policy. Very likely that your organization has one. But it's important to include AI in it, given the amount of energy required to run data centers with state-of-the-art gajillion parameters models, the amount of water needed to cool them, the carbon emissions. Minimize environmental impact as a policy. You can use something like Software Carbon Efficiency Rating, SCR from Green Software Foundation. Look for the SCR badge on the projects. Help SCR efforts by requesting the badge from uh, suppliers in your supply chain and by benchmarking and labeling your own AI projects. Green Software Foundation also developed software carbon intensity as an ISO standard 21031 to describe measurement of carbon emissions. And the same, same from Green Software Foundation had a talk yesterday about impact framework. These are all open source, so you can all get involved and engaged in, uh, in this very important uh, issue. There are commercial tools, of course, with, uh, that use these standards, use these metrics, some of their own. So uh, there, is, there are things that, that you can actually use. Sustainability could be a part of your ethical and responsible AI policy. Easily the most important policy that deserves not only a talk of its own, and Annie talked a lot about it in her talk yesterday, but it deserves a whole seminar, a life of devoted research. Um, just for inspiration, go look for some of the research uh, from those whose work on societal impact of AI you must not miss, like, Dr. Emily Bender, Dr. Sasha Luchoni, Dr. Timnit Gambrew, Dr. Margaret Mitchell, just to name a few. But anyway, the, in, in your ethical and responsible AI policy, you have to consider societal impact in broader terms and include consideration for particularly unique ethical challenges that the AI system pose, not least in fairness, inclusion, 
equity prevention of, harm, prevention of harmful outcomes in general. And the first steps in uh, verification of a functioning, responsible AI system is if it's explainable, interpretable, if its data provenance is open and transparent. For example, if we, that is, if we understand at least some, somewhat how it works. And then we need established procedures for detecting and tracking risks, because there are multiple dimensions, like, again, Annie uh, described in her talk yesterday, as well as defined roles and responsibilities for human oversight. Code of conduct in your organization and regulatory frameworks can serve as basis for implementation of these important policies. So speaking of uh, regulatory frameworks, are you ready for EU AI Act? That was a trick question, like, is anyone? <laughs> like, uh, not many AI authorities, if any, in the member states have been formed. And it's operational since August 1st, less than two months ago. It should be fully applicable in 2026. Just around the corner, two years. Data Act was published in December 2023, entered into force in January this year. And even if not directly talking about the AI, it affects ways of collecting data. So training of machine learning models, right? Cyber Resilience Act, formally adopted a mere few months ago, ink was not, is not dry yet, is expected to, and this is what the EU Commission's page says, I checked yesterday, actually it's a page updated last in July, it's expected to come into force in the second half of 2024. So any day now, right? Anyone uh, with connections in the EU Council who can shed more light on this? Um, reports on incidents are supposed to flow in 2026. Full application is expected in 2027. There are products in the market whose shelf life exceeds 2027. We have products that are already planned in, in production for uh, 2027. There are additional legislation like Product Liability Act that expands liability to software systems with AI components and others. Of course, there are equivalent legislation efforts across the globe. In the US, executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy artificial intelligence was released in October 2023 by the Biden administration. And the US National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, released a sizable AI risk management framework playbook as a pretty comprehensive compendium of suggestions to include in a compliance policy. Not something you have to do, I mean, it's not required, but it's a pretty good suggestions on uh, what, uh, what will be expected of you. Interim measures for the administration of generative artificial intelligence services is legislation enacted in July 2023 in China, for some of you easily your biggest market. Are you compliant? Of course, there are others like Canadian ADA, et cetera, and these and many more need to find way in your compliance policy, at least on a conceptual level, uh, like understanding the need for compliance. And one common, certainly industry accepted way to come closer to reaching regulatory compliance is by standard certification. ISO 42001 on artificial intelligence was published in December 2023, specifies, as it says in its abstract, requirements for establishing, implementing, maintaining, and continually improving an artificial intelligence management system. While still not required in legislation, the standard does cover many of the same topics as the regulatory frameworks on AI. Another similar standard from ISO 23894, Guidance on Risk Management in Artificial Intelligence, describes how organizations utilizing AI can manage risks specifically related to AI. And Open Chain Organization, the maintainer of ISO 5230, Standard for Open Source Compliance Programs, is running an AI study group to discuss AI compliance. As is the case with the license compliance, this initiative is open and free to participate, so please join. Will there be a new standard emerging from that initiative? Looking at ISO 5230, it would be promising, even if competing with 42001. There's a lot of cover, but a similar checklist would be more than welcome. Of course, very important aspects of legal compliance, but also in our way to encourage innovation while protecting company assets come in a form of intellectual property policy, you most certainly have defined in your organizations, right? And the unique challenges that AI pose in uh, protection of assets and respecting ownerships over assets of others 
are reflected not only in the neck breaking speed that new technologies and methodologies emerge, but in the very nature of uh, these technologies. Like, what are the best ways to protect assets created by or with AI systems? Through patents, collaborative agreements, open source? Like, at this part, I would like to advocate for open source. But of course, alignment with your uh, organization's uh, objectives might take precedence. Um, but the thing to consider may be that in most jurisdictions, AI cannot be granted copyright or be an author of a patent. Uh, even though assistance of an AI system does not preclude a person from qualifying as an inventor or copyright owner. How do we make sure that we can safeguard ownership over assets of others? For example, if an open weights model does not have transparent data provenance, does not implement some sort of backtracking of origin, for example, through embeddings, given the propensity of certain models to just repeat the data from the learning data set, how can we know if the result we're getting from the model is not burdened by a copyright claim? Okay, there's a bunch of ongoing litigation that may shed some light on that topic. It's still an issue to consider, but detection tools are varying in quality. Uh, in some areas, the situation is slightly better than the others. For example, in the uh, source code copyright and license analysis that we have to deal with uh, in, in OSPO, there are tools able to detect copyrighted uh, snippets down to a few lines of code. And this can be rather helpful to OSPO, creating copyright and license attribution artifacts uh, for their products, but it can also be a source of endless frustration given the uh, varying uh, quality of the tools and results of their analysis. Anyway, questions like these require your full attention as governance managers in your organization. But protection of organizations' assets, and indeed humans, does not end there. Novel ways in which AI systems can be open to vulnerabilities impact our security policy. Due to new attack surfaces, we need to make sure that our security policy is up to date, requires updated mitigation strategies appropriate to the use cases, adversarial machine learning, data poisoning, model theft and extraction, prompt ejection, just to name a few, require a combination of battle-tested uh, prevention and protection techniques like threat modeling, access control, etc., with additional methods like adversarial training, pattern recognition, watermarking, uh, accompanied with continuous monitoring and human oversight. There are going to be a few talks on uh, securing, well, at least generative AI projects at the uh, Secure Open Source Software Community Day on Thursday here at the Vienna Center. But <clears throat> the changes need to be addressed by the security teams and embedded in security practices and security culture of your organization, the mentality. Because even old acquaintances, exploited privileges, unauthorized access, phishing, denial of service have been strengthened by the use of AI-assisted automation. Though luckily, so have defenses against those attacks, as uh, Abhishek Arya reported in his keynote yesterday. AI governance and security governance teams have to work in unison to enhance risk and threat detection, strengthen organizations' capabilities to respond, and set up effective and proactive defensive measures. Uh, recently, I saw a security report from a reputable security solution provider that claims that around 80% of developers bypass security policies to use AI-generated code. And they also say that only around 25% of the surveyed organizations scan their code to verify security of the uh, responses they get from generative AI. Well, security, like more than ever, has to be embedded in the engineering culture of the organization. So also tried and tested best practices of code review, static analysis need to be reinforced by tools that offer threat detection support. So make sure that you update your security policies to include this. And an indelible part of security, legal compliance and responsible and ethical governance is privacy. Modern AI depends on enormous amounts of data harvested from the web. Sometimes it may include private records, records that could be used to track individuals. It's very common that models offer no protection. Though I hear that they're now working on signing models uh, in, in, uh, in OpenSSF. Often they have no capability to track where the private data ended up, where it comes from. No capability to remove the private data as the cost to do so would probably be insurmountable. Would require either retraining models without the sensitive data or even rethinking models, uh, model architecture. And so fundamental human rights, right to track your personal data, the right to erase, 
the data may well be lost in the in the weights of the model behind the essential functionality of the model gargantuan costs behind model training in the EU, <clears throat> data protection is enshrined in General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, probably the most comprehensive uh, data protection regulation. Closest equivalents, for example, in the US, the California Consumer Privacy Act, or Japan's Act on uh, Protection of Personal Information, APPI, differ in scope, consent requirements, penalties, etc. So, as a fun game of uh, whack-a-mole, Let's try to identify which of the following privacy principles from GDPR are violated by a random LLM. Data is processed lawfully, fairly, and transparently. Data is processed for a limited purpose. Minimal data needed to fulfill the purpose is processed. Accurate data to fulfill the purpose is processed. Data is processed for the limited amount of time needed for the purpose. Data is processed with appropriate security measures in place to protect the personal data on storage. So what are we to do in our organization's AI governance? We can collaborate with the security and privacy teams to implement, for example, differential privacy in data collection phase to make sure that private data can't be tracked. We can make sure that consent can be given or withdrawn. We can apply robust security measures on our end with end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. We can be transparent about how the AI system uses the data and implement techniques to access, rectify, and remove the data based on individuals' rights to do so, like regular day-to-day -day job of privacy and security officers, right? And throughout the examples here, I'd say implement this, implement that, but it's just a figure of speech to just pass the gap between setting the policy and putting it in motion. And the policy is about setting principles and direction. And so all the examples of policies I mentioned here have a very important thing in common, and that is you should strive to enable infrastructure for systemic management of processes. So let's get back to the mind map. Where are we? There's a note, establish and improve processes. Let me this time go a bit further up the tree as building blocks of any software engineering work are Creative work, building new solutions, consumption of existing solutions, distribution, collaboration. And these processes are probably already very well defined in your organizations. But the same as we think carefully about how to introduce open source to them, we definitely need to give it a bit of thought how to introduce AI in them. So common steps in deciding over if we could or should use or build an AI tool, framework, solution, whatever, can be snatched straight from the OSPO playbook. We start with identification. Interested team, engineers, data scientists, researchers will typically find out about a component or algorithm that scratches their rich, uh, solves a particular problem. Uh, investigation is started on compliance with the policies. Component algorithm under investigation is registered in a common inventory and an audit request is filed. Audit will look into the details of investigation, assess level of compliance, employ risk management or defined risk tolerance, point out the issues discovered within the audit, give appropriate feedback to the team, like approve, reject, or return to resolve the issues, and document in the inventory register. Solutions to issues, whether they are developed by the requesting team, supplier, or community, verified, recorded for posterity, and the team is on their merry way using uh, whatever they wanted to use. And the record serves as documentation for the next team in line with same or similar requests for the AI governance team to recollect past decisions, aggregate types of uh, decisions for future analysis, what have you. As these processes are continuous, as modifications and updates to the systems are made and compliance to the policies may be affected. Throughout the processes, a myriad of methods are used to serve the results, questionnaires and surveys, automated identification tools such as composition analysis and static analysis tools, model openness framework, um, automated tests and verification tools, security techniques like red teaming and blue teaming, pen testing, real world attack simulations, plenty of others. The nature, level and depth of applied techniques would depend on the problem at hand, affected policy, affected stakeholder. In general, the process should be a cog in the well-oiled machine, well-defined, repeatable, and well-documented. 
But who is going to drive this work? What roles are needed in the organization? So we collect representatives of the stakeholders and the profiles are typically legal. In OSPO, we usually have copyright and patent laws experts and AI governance expertise might additionally include privacy law, product liability, safety, etc. We need a senior staff or architect role with understanding of tech stack, product architecture development processes in the organization, interoperability between laws and technology. We have security experts who provide insights into security risks, risk mitigation methodologies and techniques. Privacy experts look into data flows with uh, regards to private data, personally identifiable information, interrupt with security measures. And of course, project manager, someone with good planning abilities, time management skills and drive. But <clears throat> you can add education specialists, you, you know, to structure education efforts and lay out teaching courses. You can add quality assurance, you can add communication experts. And so with the starting lineup of selected experts, you're looking into tactics, ways to actually implement and develop strategy, policies and processes. And this core team collaborates with the rest of the organization in a network of dedicated professionals that synchronize with the affected teams, sort of in like a hub and spoke uh, organizational topology. And I haven't given you much, right? Just a lot of questions and issues. A lot of, it depends. Well, it does depend. It's a template. You fill it with meaning. But to summarize, most corporate governance models look very much alike. We just happen to like OSPO. Yay, OSPO. It translates well into other areas and can be reused in AI governance. We start with strategic alignment with uh, organizational values and objectives a bird's view of goals and means to achieve them. We think of policies and directives, the do's and don'ts of the governance. Like, <laughs> we don't detect them all at once. We might never be finished, too many variables and moving parts, but we take a phase approach. Uh, we sync governance processes for consumption, creation, distribution, and collaboration with equivalent processes to avoid friction, enable innovation. And we collaborate as a cross-functional team, including R&D, security, project management, legal, supply management, to align with organizational objectives and company values, organizational values. And with that summary, I think we may have some time for questions and comments. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Annie? <laughs> Ladies first. Oh, geez, it was, uh, yeah, it's a brilliant tool. I li yeah, really like it. Oh, the paper was uh, like really, really good read. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I just wanted, to, are you working with uh, the to-do group? Because this is excellent, excellent like, sharing. And I'd love to like, then standardize it based on your learning. So we are not yet working with to-do group. We just recently, I think, started with Linux Foundation. So uh, as an extension, we will, we're looking into uh, helping out. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Check it out. Yes, so what was the reaction from the rest of the organization to like, use some open source model as a basis mm -hmm. for, for your policy? <laughs> like it, it, like it's uh, with any sort of a uh, organizational change in policy, it's it, it varies. It's 50-50. There are people who are like very welcoming. Oh, super cool. We have this organization who already has experiences with all of this, but then they were like, those who were, ah, yeah, you know, we know better. So like we have this uh, documentation system that we're using, maybe we should do that. And you know, it's a, it's a dialogue and uh, like we do in open source, it's, it's collaboration. We, we embrace, you know, both old and new. And uh, so changes are enacted slowly but steadily. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Give it my best. 
Really good work. I often come back to it and just return to it, and then people ask me a bit, okay, how do we do this? Well, let's check. <laughs> so you can just go and, you know, navigate through your thoughts, and, you know, there's always something. Yes? Andrew, thank you for a great talk. It's a thank you. systematization thank you. of open source and AI. So I have an obvious impression about, so we have a spectrum of people working on open source, from developers, hmm to the real advocates, to kind of OSPA, and like open source bureaucracy. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's call it that. And yeah. is a big company, right? And I've been in the big company before. So, key question, how do you keep it real? How do you make sure that all people involved in this are connected to people who write code, and as a result of all of this, is code being written not a bunch of documentation and policies and uh, paper, paper, paperwork? Yeah, so, so, so I mentioned, I, I, I might have like glanced through it, but I, I hope uh, that it resonated. We created a network of people who, who work with this, like in their own teams. And it's like a, uh, we, we call it hub and spoke. So everybody is, is involved. So every team has a, either a person or the entire team is involved in the work, you know? And so we have like uh, meetups and, uh, you know, calls and, and common documentation and all that. And it's just like a collaborative uh, community. Right. How do you make sure that developers are happy with all these artifacts of policy and management? Yeah. Like, and not hinders them, does it become one more thing? Yeah. So, okay. so it's, uh, that's a really good question. And we, we started first with writing policies that are actually readable, mm -hmm. right? That people can just go and see, okay, okay, this is what I need to do. I need more details. Okay, I will check if there are more details. But then also, you know, there are like very diverse engineering groups who use their own tools, their own methodologies. And we don't say, okay, you, you should use this or you should use that. Let's try and figure out what is the common denominator and how we can, you know, make it work for you. Mm -hmm. And so the, the core group uh, in the governance, like in OSPO and AI governance is there to also help. So we're not like, you know, these lawmakers, this is what, what must be done, but uh, we're like a helpful bunch. We go around and, uh, and talk to people yeah, and, uh, you know, work with them. So I, I you know, want to ask you a question about the privacy that you mentioned. Yeah. Brilliant. You mentioned differential privacy, and that kind of, so I would say cryptographically oriented uh, methodologies, maybe even for the framework of encryption and so on. Mm. But I wanted to ask you, do you have experience in using custody execution environments and uh, this approach huh. that, that would be yeah, okay. uh, harder, supported, harder accelerated, and would give us a performance while guaranteeing the privacy uh, being kept? That's a, that, that's a really good question, but uh, let me come back uh, to you with that. I, I'm not really sure. I haven't been in touch with uh, that part of, uh, of the company that's working on uh, TE. Uh, while in Sony Mobile, we, we did a lot of that. Uh, that was, so I last in Sony, it was in, in three years ago, but in consumer electronics, we did a lot of that. Uh, I'm pretty sure in, in Volvo Cars, we also do that, uh, but I will have to double check that for you. And also for my <laughs> for my sanity, it's a really good question. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, anyway, I will be around, so you can just uh, grab me for question, comments, whatever. Cup of coffee. Um, and yeah, if no more questions, thank you all for for coming and.